Welcome to the Pinnacle Awards of the American Pharmacists Association Foundation. The APHA Foundation Pinnacle Awards celebrate significant contributions to the medication use process by honoring the achievements of individuals and organizations that work ceaselessly to improve healthcare through innovative pharmacy services. This year's Pinnacle Award recipients were chosen based on their dedication to advancing patient care and for increasing patient access to pharmacist-delivered care, reducing medication misadventures, promoting the use of national treatment guidelines, or enhancing communication among healthcare team members. Special thanks relating to this year's Pinnacle Awards goes to Merck for its premier support. Those honored today truly exemplify the future of pharmacy practice. Please join in celebrating and being inspired by the recipients of this year's APHA Foundation Pinnacle Awards. Right. Spacing from the mic. I'm Ben Blummel, for those of you who don't know me. I serve as our Executive Director and Senior Vice President for Research and Innovation at the APHA Foundation. On behalf of the American Pharmacists Association and the APHA Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to our 26th Annual Pinnacle Awards Program. We're pleased you're here with us this afternoon. Since 1998, the APHA Foundation has hosted the Pinnacle Awards celebration and has now recognized 78 individuals and groups demonstrating excellence and innovation in safe and effective medication use through pharmacist patient care services. Today, we'll recognize three new and exceptional Pinnacle Award recipients leading the way to improve medication use and healthcare outcomes. The APHA Foundation's mission is to improve health by inspiring philanthropy, research, and innovation that advances pharmacist patient care services. It's the embodiment of the Pinnacle Awards program. We support programs and conduct research that demonstrate how pharmacists improve the quality of patient health outcomes and are essential members of the healthcare team. Tonight, we'd like to recognize Merck for providing support to the APHA Foundation Pinnacle Awards program this year. Without this support, the program simply wouldn't be possible, and we extend our sincere gratitude to Merck and the whole team. I'd like to ask Merck representative Marty to actually stand and be recognized. Next, I'd like to ask all of the members of our APHA Foundation Board of Directors who are here this afternoon to stand. And we'd like to extend them a special welcome and thank them for their work and contributions to advancing the Foundation's mission and the practice transformation work of Team APHA. So thank you. In addition, I'd like to ask all of the APHA Board of Trustees members who are in attendance to also stand so that we can extend our gratitude for their support of the foundation. <laughs> Your support is essential to us um, achieving our mission. So right now at this time, I'm going to ask Valerie Prince, APHA president, to come forward and share her opening remarks. Valerie. Hi. It's my pleasure to be here this afternoon to support the award ceremony. The APHA Board of Trustees appreciates the work of the foundation and its programs, such as this one, and we look forward to continued collaboration to advance the profession together. The list of former recipients of this award is an illustrious one. Our three honorees today add to the amazing impact of the program and continue to show how pharmacists enhance medication use and advance patient care. Congratulations to the 2023 Pinnacle Award recipients and thank you to APHA Foundation and our sponsor for hosting today's reception. I'd now like to introduce and welcome Ann Jeanette Wyatt, President of the APHA Foundation, to provide a welcome. Thank you, Valerie. I would like to welcome everyone here again. 
I am very honored to be here this afternoon recognizing the efforts of our honorees. Before we begin the program, I'd like to specifically recognize our devoted supporters of the 1953 Society contributors participating in the Pinnacle Awards this afternoon. Please give them a round of applause. We thank these individuals for supporting the work of the Foundation to bolster innovative practice, research, and scholarship. Through their annual support and the generosity of all of our contributors, we are leading, we are empowering, we are innovating, and we encourage you to visit the APHA Foundation uh, website, which is aphafoundation.org, to learn how the foundation's work support the profession's effort to improve health of the health of individuals and of communities throughout America. We also want to recognize the outstanding work of the 2023 Pinnacle Award Selection Committee. These individuals had a very challenging task as our nominees this year were all very deserving. Please join me in thanking the following four individuals. And as I call your name, would you please stand? John Graves. is the Associate Dean for Global Engagement at the UNC Eshelman School of Pharmacy. He is also an Associate Professor in the Division of Practice Advancement and Clinical Education. In addition, he is Director of the two-year Master of Science in Pharmaceutical Sciences with a specialization in Health System Pharmacy Administration. 
At UNC Medical Center, he is Residency Program Director of the two-year program in Health System Pharmacy Administration. I am very humbled to receive the 2023 APHA Foundation Pinnacle Award for Individual Career Achievement. The medication use process forms the foundation of my research, as well as my approach to education within the pharmacy school. My personal philosophy is that I firmly believe that the pharmacy department, which is comprised of pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, as well as um, support staff, that group should be accountable and responsible for the entirety of the medication use process. That includes both acute care as well as ambulatory care. When I make that statement, many times I get challenged about, well, we don't prescribe, we don't administer, maybe dispensing is something that we can be responsible for, but those other steps are the responsibility of others. While I understand the idea behind that sentiment, my personal belief is that while we might not do those things, we are responsible for the system in which they operate. So how medications are prescribed, how medications are administered, and we can ensure that those systems are cost effective, they drive appropriate outcomes, they minimize medication errors, things that pharmacists are well positioned to take leadership over. And when you begin thinking through it in that realm, you can see why responsibility becomes something that I believe is important for the pharmacy department. Now, the other thing that I challenge my students is we don't want anybody to practice pseudo pharmacy. That might not be a term you're familiar with, but the concept is we can say one thing we want to do this, but in reality, we don't do it on every patient. We don't do it every day of the week. We don't do it every hour of the day. And when there's that mismatch, that's when you begin practicing pseudo pharmacy. And so as we approach responsibility for the medication use process, we also need to ensure that what we're committing to is always there for the patient. There are also a lot of people that I can thank for this award. First of all, I've been fortunate that the entirety of my career has been spent at both UNC Medical Center as well as UNC Eshelman School of Pharmacy. I firmly believe there is no better environment in which to practice, research, and innovate. In addition to that, I've had a variety of different mentors who have invested in my own personal development. The first one I'll mention is my father, Fred Eckel. He's been there from the beginning, encouraging me, challenging me, and when I really needed help, giving me guidance on what I should do. The second individual is Jim McAllister. When I did my residency, he was there, and then he was my first boss at UNC Medical Center. He's believed in me, but he's also created opportunities for me to grow, develop, and flourish. But beyond those two individuals, there's many other colleagues that have come in and out of UNC that have also provided different roles of encouragement, challenge, and growth. I've also been fortunate to work with many, many residents over the years that I've been able to see to grow, develop, and take on jobs around the country. But even though as I've invested in them, they've also challenged me by the way they've asked questions and just observing how they approach problem solving. And I've been able to learn from them and apply it to my own professional development. I've also taught many master's graduate students who've gone on and have responsibility and accountability for the medication use process around the country. And I've always challenged them, make sure that you don't practice pseudo pharmacy. I'd like to provide a special thanks to Bob Granko and Tyler Vest, who nominated me for this award and individuals that I've collaborated and had as friends over the years. As a longtime member of APHA, it is always gratifying to be recognized by your peers and this honor provides energy to keep fighting on improving the use of medications in all practice sites because our patients deserve much better than what they have today. Thank you.
ladies and gentlemen, this is Stephen Ever. considers uh, three uh, types of practice settings uh, in, uh, in, in, in aggregate. Uh, group practices, health systems, and healthcare corporations. Uh, the Pinnacle Award for this category recognizes a significant quality improvement project in one or more of the following areas. Fostering the role of multidisciplinary healthcare teams to improve medication use. Preventing or eliminating adverse drug reactions. Developing innovations and in quality improvement techniques to enhance medication use, or innovating in the management of drug therapy while significantly improving patient outcomes. You know, uh, we really need envelopes. This is going to be. Okay. Maybe next year. Uh, the 2023 Pinnacle Award for Group Practices, Health Systems, Healthcare Corporations goes to Correct RX Pharmacy Services. Let's learn a bit about them. RX is a national leader in correctional and clinical pharmacy services headquartered in Hanover, Maryland. Correct RX was founded in 2003 by three pharmacists and has been providing services for over 20 years. They currently furnish services to over 200,000 incarcerated patients in over 400 correctional and juvenile facilities. CorrectRx's unique corporate vision is based on the practice of clinical pharmacy, collaborating with interdisciplinary healthcare teams to manage a patient's health rather than strictly filling prescriptions. Our unique company vision is based on the practice of clinical pharmacy, collaborating with the healthcare teams. CorrectRx's clinical programming has been developed, implemented, and proven to improve quality in healthcare over the last 20 years. As clinical pharmacists, we collaborate with providers and nurses in several capacities. Just to mention a few, we round weekly on patients in the infirmary, respond to medication management consults, and perform clinical initiatives, in addition to chairing regional p and meetings. We also serve as members on multidisciplinary panels, such as chronic pain management and HIV hepatitis C. Seeing patients in the correctional setting presents a unique set of challenges, but ultimately is rewarding. For example, when we're treating our diabetic patients, we have to consider that their food choices and ability to have recreational time are determined by the prison facilities. This provides a unique opportunity for us as pharmacists to be creative with lifestyle and diet changes when counseling our patients. Just like any other health system, state correctional health systems are budget and quality conscious. CorrectRx Coke program has spearheaded hepatitis C treatment and have maintained utilization and outcomes data to help secure the state's budget for Hep C for almost 20 years. Georgia, the fourth largest correctional system in the country, trusted that clinical pharmacy would make an impact on this vulnerable patient population. We started by learning Georgia's correctional healthcare structure. Combined with our knowledge in other systems, we were then able to build and deploy clinical pharmacy programs specific to Georgia's needs. CorrectRx has implemented key system-wide services, such as clinical pharmacists directed prior authorization, antimicrobial stewardship, and polypharmacy reviews. The results our clinical pharmacists produce has expanded acceptance of these programs. Our successes continue to push other correctional systems away from dispensing only pharmacy towards a model that values clinical pharmacy benefits to overall population health. And we're the national team. team. On the national clinical team, we work with a multifarious patient population in facilities nationwide, ranging from rural county jails to large prisons. Our patients come from a myriad of backgrounds, many of whom have never received any medical care. We work with each facility's medical and non-medical leadership to provide the most contemporary and comprehensive medical care, advising on medication selection, treatment clinical pathways, and regulatory affairs. 
We provide consultations on high acuity patients, medication reviews for juvenile sites, and formulary management. Cracktrax is honored to be publicly recognized with the Pinnacle Award for our innovative and advanced clinical pharmacy programs. Correctrix has been a pioneer for over 20 years in promoting the role of clinical pharmacists in the correctional healthcare arena. I am particularly proud of our highly dedicated and credentialed pharmacists who have implemented very sophisticated and complex programs in this non-traditional setting. The Pinnacle Award shines a light on Correctrix's steadfast commitment to the profession of pharmacy and it's a wonderful validation of the positive impact we're having on the patient's lives we serve, as, long, as well as the public health nationwide. In closing, I will express my sincerest gratitude to the APHA for this wonderful honor. Thank you very much.
start this company. We had 11 employees, including ourselves and the other owner. And uh, one of them was a clinical pharmacist out of 11. And we um, funded that. We believed, it was like Don Quixote fighting windmills. Um, no one was doing it. I mean, in corrections, we would get in there and say, you really need a clinical pharmacist. And so we uh, had to support it and then prove that it worked. And then the next thing you know is that I want a clinical pharmacist. I want another clinical pharmacist. So now we have 22 clinical pharmacists deployed in three states around the country and in um, uh, some of our private facilities as well. And then corporately, we have all the programs after 20 years of working on this to support what they do in the field. So when our pharmacists start, they have a roadmap and they don't spend six months wandering around a correctional facility wondering what they're supposed to do. They know exactly how to get started and they can immediately make an impact. So we measure every intervention, we measure every outcome of our patients, and we track what we're doing so that we have the data to support what clinical pharmacists do. I believed it inherently down to my toes when I started. I didn't have the data to prove it. But 20 years later, we've got a lot of data. And so thank you so very much for this recognition. It means so much to us, all of us. And now for the third category, we bundled together volunteer health agencies, nonprofit organizations, associations, government agencies, and public-private partnerships. And the Pinnacle Award for this category recognizes an organization that assists patients and their caregivers to achieve better outcomes from their medications. Examples include patient education initiatives, programs that promote patient understanding, improve adherence to drug therapy, or prevent or eliminate adverse drug events, Part and partnerships between public and private entities to improve patient outcomes. And so the 2023 Pinnacle Award in the category of, of volunteer health agencies, nonprofits, associations, agencies, and partnerships goes to, and you've, it's an acrylic podium, so you realize there's no envelope. <laughs> the St. Vincent de Paul Charitable Pharmacy in Cincinnati, Ohio. Let's, let's take a look. The Society of St. Vincent de Paul, Cincinnati, is a network of neighbors inspired by gospel values, growing in holiness and building a more just world through personal relationships with and service to people in need. St. Vincent de Paul Charitable Pharmacy is one component of the society and is dedicated to the unique mission of providing free pharmaceutical care to people in need who have no other way to access their prescription medications. The Charitable Pharmacy helps patients achieve positive health outcomes that lead to improved quality of life while also lowering health care costs to care for the underserved across this community. Since opening in 2006, the Charitable Pharmacy has dispensed over 717,000 free prescriptions with a value exceeding $99 million. My name is Rusty Currington, VP of Pharmacy for St. Vincent de Paul. Now you might be asking yourself, what is a Charitable Pharmacy? Well, we're much like any other community pharmacy with one big difference. We don't have cash registers. We don't bill insurance. We don't accept payment from our patients. And over 750 people every month receive services from us. It doesn't sound like a sustainable business model, does it? Giving out medications for free? And yet for 17 years, we've filled 750,000 prescriptions valued at $110 million. How is this possible? Well, a community here in Cincinnati prioritize this. We wrote law, we changed, uh, changed policies and procedures here in Ohio that would permit the donations from end users, from nursing homes and long-term care pharmacies. We receive medication donations from drug samples uh, f uh, through doctor's offices, through drug wholesalers, through drug manufacturers. Leveraging our relationships to make sure we have 87% uh, of our prescriptions filled with donated resources. 
Combined with volunteer labor and our outcomes-based approach to care, we're able to leverage these relationships to ensure that our community does not go without medications. When I started in 2013, we had only 20 vials of insulin a month. And now to see over 200 people a month receive insulin from us is life-saving. Thank you, APHA and the APHA Foundation for the Pinnacle Award. You're highlighting the practice of charitable pharmacy. We want so many more like us to exist across the country, and this is one step in that direction. Over the years, since 2006, the St. Vincent de Paul Charitable Pharmacy has consistently tried to be an advocate for underserved patients in our area by recognizing their needs and adapting the program to meet those needs. In the charitable pharmacy space, we have learned through the outcomes process that underserved patients are the population in most need of our clinical services. Providing free medication to them without these services really doesn't get to the core of the problem. I strongly feel that the pharmacy profession, and in particular, community pharmacists, must escape the image of medication dispensers as they are viewed by most of the public. I think the only way we will escape it is through outcomes-based pharmacy community care. We must prove that our services prevent hospitalizations and ER visits and improve adherence in A1C. I believe insurance will consistently pay for our services if we prove our services enhance patient care. I am grateful to the APHA Foundation for recognizing our pharmacy program and its achievements. Although a number of awards have been received over the years, I personally believe this one to be the most significant as it comes within the profession we love so much.
many thanks for all that you do, each of, each of you. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers for the annual Innovation in Pharmacy Lecture. And this year's lecture will be presented by uh, two of the officials from uh, CorrectRx, Kareem Parara, who is the Georgia Statewide Clinical Pharmacy Director, and Dr. Hugh Sayo, who is the Chief Clinical Officer uh, for CorrectRx Pharmacy Services. Uh, and there will be Q&A at the end, so if you're shy, make sure you finish the glass of wine in front of you, because we're not leaving until we get a few questions. Uh, the title of today's uh, uh, lecture is Breaking Barriers, Clinical Pharmacy Programs for Incarcerated Patients. And please welcome uh, Kareem and Q. service to both from the famous South African leader Nelson Mandela who himself was incarcerated for 27 years. It is said that no one truly knows a nation until one has been inside of its jails. A nation should not be judged by how it treats its highest citizens but its lowest ones. And that is indeed what providing care to the incarcerated population is all about. Serving patients who often have never had an interaction with the medical system. So things we're going to cover today, an overview of incarceration. It's important we provide the background to the system that we're providing service to and that everyone who's listening to this understands how medical care is often provided in a correctional setting as it varies from the community. We'll talk about correctional health care in general, how it's provided how we have created a role for clinical pharmacy in that setting, the barriers that we encounter and continue to encounter in the future. So let's start with some basic statistics. The Bureau of Justice Statistics, which is an arm of the Department of Justice, in their most recent incarceration survey, said that there are just under 2 million people incarcerated in the United States, or about 1% of the adult population. That rate of incarceration is 565 per 100,000 residents. And when we look at how that population is distributed, the vast majority of folks who are incarcerated are in state prisons, over a million. Over 500,000 are incarcerated in local jails. Over 200,000 in the federal system, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, which is well known to this audience and their role in pharmacy, and of over 100,000 uh, in other type of correctional systems, think uh, juvenile detention, immigration customs enforcement. So what are the reasons people find themselves incarcerated? Well, again, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, 821,000, or 44%, for violent crime, assault, uh, things like that. 19%, 300, over 300,000 for drug offenses. This is an air, uh, in the 80s and 90s, in the early 2000s, when the incarcerated population grew a lot in the United States. Uh, this is the area that saw the most growth, people getting locked up for drug offenses. 15% for property crimes, burglary, other related and a similar percentage and number for public order crimes, things like prostitution, solicitation, and then everything else, over 100,000. Oftentimes, the reasons for incarceration are societal failures, mental health disorders, 
We have a deficient mental health care infrastructure in this country. People with undiagnosed and untreated mental health disorders do experience increased risks of incarceration. Having the police called out for strange behavior often results in a trip to jail. There are more people with serious mental health disorders in most large jail systems in this country than any single psychiatric hospital. And it places a huge burden on these correctional systems. And it's estimated that more than half of incarcerated individuals have a psychiatric disorder, disorder versus 10% of the general population. Drug dependence and the opioid epi epidemic has also spilled into the correctional facilities that we provide service to. Research from the American Society of Addiction Medicine has found that more than half of individuals with an opioid use disorder reported a history of involvement in the criminal legal system. And up to a third of heroin users passed through the, cor the correctional system in any given year. So let's learn a little bit, now that we know about where folks are incarcerated, why they're incarcerated, let's learn a little bit more about the structure of the correctional system. You'll often hear of jail and prison used as interchangeable terms, they're very much not interchangeable terms. The jail is pretrial detention. These are folks who have not been found guilty of anything, but the court system has deemed that they pose a risk to society uh, while they have, uh, have their case adjudicated. Jails are also typically administered by local governments, the county you live in, the city you live in. Prison houses sentenced individuals who have been found guilty of a crime and is typically administered by the states and the federal government. And then there's this bucket of reentry, which is relatively newer um, for folks who are transitioning back into the community for them to, from prison, to receive support services to uh, re-enter society as more productive citizens. So what's the average length of stay in one of these places? Well, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, in the US, uh, local jail stay is under 30 days. And in state prisons, it's under three years. The average turnover in a local jail is 50% every week. The point being, these are people who return back into our communities, and often more quickly than you would imagine. So now that we have the background of this population, let's talk about the right to health care. The incarcerated population is the only population in this country that is constitutionally guaranteed the right to health care. This was established in the landmark Supreme Court case, Estelle v. Gamble, in 1976. Mr. Estelle was a Texas Department of Corrections inmate who was assigned to a work detail unloading cotton bales from a truck. The cotton bale fell on him, he hurt his back, and he couldn't perform his work duties anymore. He did not receive care for his injury. In fact, he was retaliated against, and he was placed in segregated housing because he wouldn't perform in his work detail. He initiated what's called a pro se lawsuit, a handwritten lawsuit that we often still see in the system today. Um, and he uh, won uh, after a couple years. And the Supreme Court established the standard that deliberate indifference to serious medical needs of prisoners constitutes uh, cruel and unusual punishment. So the health challenges in this population are significant. In the US, being non-white, low income, undereducated, homeless, and uninsured are predictors of poor health. And compared to the general population, the incarcerated population exhibits these predictors disproportionately. There's a lot of overlap. As a result, that our population, the incarcerated population, has a number of shared health profile characteristics that we've talked about already. Mental health disorders, drug dependence, infectious disease, untreated HIV, hepatitis C, and other chronic conditions that have never been managed in the community. For example, hepatitis C in the incarcerated population, according to the CDC, the infection rate is 10 times that that you see in the community, in the incarcerated population. And 
The American Society of Addiction and Medicine has found that two thirds of incarcerated individuals have a history of sub uh, substance use disorder, be it opioid use disorder or uh, alcohol. An alarming statistic is that 5% of all deaths from illicit opioids occur from people who were recently released from jail or prison in the last month. So now with all that background, let's talk about how healthcare is delivered in a correctional facility. It starts with an intake screen. They often occur in the local county jail. Someone who's just been arrested gets taken to booking. That person is going to have be examined by a nurse. They're going to take some basic demographics. They're going to figure out what medications they're taking, what conditions they have. There's going to be calls to local pharmacies, local physicians, um, to try and uh, understand the health history of this patient. It's made even more challenging by the fact that these people may be high they may be drunk, they may be poor historians, they may have expressed mental health disorders. It's very, very challenging, um, uh, the intake process. Uh, these folks will then, after they're seen, initially seen by a nurse, have a provider visit within uh, seven to 14 days, depending on the local standard. Following that, they'll have a chronic care. Our, one of the great things about providing care in a correctional setting is that patients will receive chronic care on a schedule. It's often dictated by accreditation guidelines. Um, so in every 90 uh, days, 280 days, they're gonna see a provider uh, based on their individual health conditions. And um, there is a good opportunity for follow-up, particularly in prison. Sick calls where uh, individuals will have the opportunity to hand a often paper slip um, although it, meant it is moving electronic to a correctional officer or a nurse, that they have an immediate health need that they need taken care of. It could be anything from a cold to they hurt their shoulder. In pharmacy, the scope of services is uh, it typically involves for a typical county system or prison prescription fulfillment. Prescription fulfillment is done uh, through specialized uh, software. It's often done in unit dose packaging, blister cards. There are safety considerations and types of packaging that we can provide with respect to metal tubes and inhalers that can be turned into weapons. Um, so there is an, an art to providing dispensing pharmacy services. But one of the things Dr. Seal will talk more about is there's often uh, not a component for clinical services. And that is one of the things that we have pushed very hard to change in our industry. And then medication administration, something that we have to consider and assist with in these facilities, uh, is often done uh, multiple ways. Uh, they are, uh, offenders can be given uh, a 30 day supply of medication to take themselves according to directions. That of course is limited by local policy, the type of medication, the type of patient. Um, and then oftentimes medications are passed by nurses. Um, cell side, unit to unit, uh, and it can be, uh, yeah, your typical county jail may house 500 people. Um, so these are, it's a very significant portion of uh, nursing duties. I'll pass the presentation to Dr. Seal. All right, Spiker. Yeah, I have to stop. I'll be taking applications if you're interested in working with us. <laughs> Come on, don't let the barbed wire fence, the steel bars, the fact that you can't even control the doors, don't let that stop you. So I tell you what, it has not stopped us. That's the gospel truth. The circumstances are what they are. It doesn't diminish that there's a real need for a couple pharmacists providing care. Any takers? <laughs> In order to tell our story, we gotta kind of go back in time. I'm gonna give you a little brief. 2003, Correct Rex opened the stores. 2005, Correct Rex won the contract to service the Maryland Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services. It took me 17 years to learn how to say that in one breath. <laughs> but in the contract, there was a requirement for 3.4 full-time equivalents to do what? Unpack the boxes. Making sure the medications got to the patient. Well, 
Ellen, our CEO and president, beautiful photo of Ellen. She appreciates that. We've always had a vision that pharmacists can do so much more and that we're valuable contributors to patient care. She knew exactly what she was going to do with those 3.4 pharmacists, and they certainly are not going to be unhappy with patient pharmacists. They're going to be working collaboratively with that. Watch that one. Working alongside the care providers, making sure the medications are used appropriately, that we're really applying evidence based medicine, that there's a level playing field for the patients in the setting. So, Ella being who she is, visionary, determined, and unstoppable, got the state of Maryland, the bureaucracy of Maryland, to see that vision. And so now, from those 3.4 clinical pharmacists, we have 22 clinical pharmacists working inside jails and prisons all across the country. What a remarkable story. All right, this is a busy slide. You all ready? Take a deep breath. It's a lot. Pharmacists, we all do a lot. We wear a variety of different hats. We're care providers. We wear the social worker hat in corrections, resource manager or educator, except our students aren't pharmacy students. They're the patients, the care providers, you know, the prescribers, the nurses. Our clinical programs are diverse. We've included some samples here. But all these activities, they're on the board because they've illustrated impact to outcomes, health literacy, and eventually, the hope is it translates into serving our communities. We strongly believe, or rather hope, that incarceration is a temporary status. And when our patients are released, their improved health status will decrease the burden on our community. We've demonstrated through our disease management programs like diabetes that our clinical pharmacists reduced the HbA1c by an average of 2.9%. Our war for patients remained in the therapeutic window longer, an average of 66% compared to about 59% in the community. Our population is getting older, and there's an increased need for specialized geriatric services. And managing costs is probably one of the most important roles because these systems have a fixed budget. They can't go back and say, oh, we need more money. It doesn't work that way. We got one pot. And from that one pot, they got to take care of a multitude, potentially unlimited number of patients. So we provide services and expertise in formulary management, um, you know, for cost-effective prescribing. Uh, our clinical pharmacists also participate in prior authorization reviews, so they get these requests for non-formulary medications. But instead of just looking at the drug itself, we really take that as an opportunity again to educate, educate providers. We take that as an opportunity not just to look at the drug, but to look at the patient as a whole. Are the other medications correct? And also, get the provider on the phone. They hate talking to us on the phone for some reason, but. We love getting them on the phone and going through the clinical pathways, the rationales, building in the rational the drug selection process. Our clinical pharmacists ran in infirmaries. Uh, infirmaries are an old term. I'm not a big fan of that term. But essentially, these units are stepped out. So when our patients get released from the hospital, they require around the clock, clock care by nursing staff and by providers. And so they go to what we call an infirmary. We'll talk about Hep C in a little bit more detail because that's an excellent example of how we're making a significant impact on public health. Polypharmacy is a national problem. We have an over-reliance of medications to solve all of our patients' problems. Our polypharmacy initiative enrolls patients with uh, 10 or more medications, including OTCs. And our clinical pharmacist will evaluate, go through the whole patient, make sure each of those medication orders have a reason, make sure it's clinically indicated. 
You know, uh, our uh, co vendors, uh, you know, the medical providers, uh, they have a fixation on cost and high cost patients. And really, in my personal opinion, it's not the high cost drugs that put patients in the hospitals, it's drugs like ibuprofen, naproxen. It's those medications that are over the counter that we feel are innocuous but have tremendous risk associated with them. And so our polypharmacy initiative is taking that lens to those patients making sure those medications are appropriate. What is truly extraordinary is that these clinical programs, they're being provided to correctional patients inside of correctional systems. These services probably would not have been available to our patients had they not been incarcerated. I've been told or shared countless stories where patients would have died if they weren't incarcerated. And uh, I've been doing this for 17 years. And I can't imagine doing anything else with my professional uh, career. The writer of this mail has great handwriting, better than mine. <laughs> but all pharmacists want to be recognized for their contributions to patient care. This is a letter from the patient. It was sent to Liz, one of our clinical pharmacists who works in the state of Delaware. She's a highly credentialed diabetes educator. And interestingly, she's also a licensed nurse. She actually started off as a licensed nurse in one of the corrections. So did that give you enough time to read the letter? <laughs> this letter is an example. Uh, all of our clinical pharmacists have been told something similar. Our patients are very grateful. I think this was the most surprising thing for me personally is how grateful our patients are. When we sit make time, we make appointments to see them in clinic, they're so grateful because the doctors are doing it where they're trying to take care of the patient. But he will take time out to make sure the patients understand why they're on these medications, why they hear it's so important. I, I think it's invaluable. I can honestly say our pharmacists are more trusted than the care providers. That's saying a lot. So an important aspect of why we do what we do is knowing we're making a difference on the patient patients who otherwise would be more forgotten in our society. All right. We've kind of alluded to two examples for you. There's two. But these two examples are our clinical programs, opportunities where we can make a direct impact on public health. The first one is hepatitis C. Our goal is to treat and cure as many patients with hepatitis C as we can. Prevalence of hep C is higher in corrections. The infection rate is 10 times higher than the general public. Sadly, 30% of our patients uh, with hep C have spent part of a year inside a correctional facility. That's staggering. The World Health Organization has a goal to eradicate hepatitis C by 2030. The Biden administration has proposed a budget, the 2024 budget, to work towards eliminating, eliminating hepatitis C in the United States. We're doing our part towards these goals. In addition to developing the care plans for curing our patients, our pharmacists are increasing awareness about hep C treatment, provide education to not only the patients but the primary care doctors. Um, just providing education to the that prison tattoo you're thinking about getting on your chest, not a good idea. That's probably the top reason why people get hep C in prisons. Just as important, uh, the team maintains a database of our patients. And it provides an invaluable resource that demonstrates the public health contribution of the correctional health system in the management of hep C in the community. For example, our Maryland team they regularly present their outcomes data at the Maryland Hepatitis Summit. And this meeting helps us track our progress toward our goal of eradicating MC. 
substance use disorder, specifically opioid use disorder. Um, this is very near and dear to my heart because prior to the pandemic, prior to the lockdown, we were traveling all across the country educating jails and prisons about MOUD, medication for opioid use disorder. Our local pharmacists uh, provide an invaluable role in providing MOUD. Because our patients are at the highest risk for opioid overdose deaths, this work is very important. There's disparity in the provision of MOUD in the country. Some facilities have a long history of providing MOUD, but uh, one of our systems that would support the Maryland Department of Health and Safety and Correctional Systems, look like they did again. Uh, they have a long history of providing MOUD, including methadone. However, there are many correction systems in the country where there is inst institutional inertia to providing MOUD. So if you're not familiar, um, the main treatment modalities for MOUD is using opioids or partial atoms. And so it's a big mental leap for sheriffs and jail administrators to treat people with opioid substance abuse with other opioids. And it requires lots of education. What's really helped is that over the last couple of years, states have mandated, mandated by law to provide MOUD to incarcerated patients. In many of these laws, the jails and prisons, they have to continue what the patients were receiving in the community, including methadone. So some of you may already know that only OTPs can provide methadone. I think this is a real opportunity for us as a country to kind of break barriers. We look at our DA rules, federal rules, for how uh, opioid substance abuse is treated in the country. As you can imagine, our clients require lots of education and guidance uh, because of the restrictions for methadone. We assist our clients in becoming OTPs and peer treatment programs. We provide education on what the regulatory landscape looks like, what the requirements are. And it's no easy task because we're simply no experts. Now, we have, uh, if there's any DEA representatives in the audience, I want to say thank you because the DEA regional offices are very helpful. Um, there are regional differences in how these rules and regs are interpreted. And, uh, I, always don't he I don't hesitate reaching out to our DEA partners. And um, I was so happy with the data waiver for the XDA licenses were repealed. It made providing buprenorphine so much easier to our patients. Uh, one other thing that's not on the slide, Narcan, nasal Narcan. It's, it, MOUD can't be provided without nasal Narcan, they go hand in hand. So we work with jails and prison systems all across the country making sure they have affordable nasal Narcan. All right, correctional considerations. I want to say that you, in the audience, as voters, you're the boss. Your votes matter. Because your votes elect the officials, the governors, the mayors. They dictate the policy. They hire the superintendents, the commissioners, the directors that oversee these correction programs. MOUD is a great example of that. It was done through the electoral process. There's always a balance between public safety and healthcare needs, and uh, this really is a challenge for us. Keep in mind that correctional facilities were built to maintain public safety, not to provide healthcare. If there's a disturbance, a fight, the whole unit, or maybe the whole facility, will get locked down. That means we can't see our patients. The nurses can't go out and provide medications. So public safety, unfortunately, is a priority at the moment. Purchasing procurement. 
This is the widget battle. Are you all familiar with the widget battle? The widgets are commodities. Virtual tire, the pharmacy services being viewed as commodities. We battle this. Thank you. We provide is a service making sure medications are used appropriately to improve outcomes and to reduce adverse effects. It's a procurement people, but don't worry. We're uh, winning their minds and heart in one state at a time. In the facilities, there's no shortage of locks. There's security's top priority. You have to wait until they open the doors for you, until they escort your patient to the clinic. Keep in mind that medical care is one of many adjacent activities that are going on. They have to pass out meals. They have to pick up the dirty laundry and clean the units. And uh, inmates uh, and our patients move about. They all interfere with healthcare operations. So there's a performance of coordination that goes in, a very strong understanding of the correctional system in order to provide local pharmacists to the side of these facilities. Then there's violence in the facilities. This is the pink elephant in the room. That's probably the most common question I get when I interview potential candidates to work inside of the city. Is it safe? I would say it's safer than working at the community pharmacy. There's no one else. There's plenty of security people around. But violence is a real threat. Uh, luckily, our pharmacists have never been involved. Most of the violence is directed at other inmates or security officers. And uh, kudos to security because they have a tough job. The great security officers, they're the ones that are counselors with the ability to diffuse confrontations and makes a world of difference. When the violence can't be contained, the whole facility locks out. It's the scariest thing. I've only been through one. I wasn't in the facility. Some of our team members were in the facility. And they were locked in the facility for 18 hours. The whole time, so worried. For 18 hours. And then finally we get the call. Jamie calls and says, we're out. <laughs> but Hugh, I'm going back in. What? You're going back in? She said, yeah, there's people hurt. Security officers hurt. Inmates hurt. They need care. We're very fortunate that we have a great team committed, committed to taking care of our patients. Staff recruitment. It's not easy. I'm sure everyone in this room has gone through something similar. It's not easy. But even if you find the right candidate, not everyone's cut out to work in this environment. They really have to have a passion for public health. We're almost done. But I went in on this note, looking forward. We're going to continue to, to build a body of evidence demonstrating the value of clinical pharmacy, not just in what we do, but our entire profession. We rely on the data to drive change. And I just want to say thank you. Magali and the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy, through their partnership, they take our, our data that we're generating the interventions, and they create meaning. Meaning to take to procurement folks, to non-healthcare folks, and say, look what our clinical pharmacy programs are doing. And that's why we're able to, we're able to grow from 3.4 FTEs to 22. We look forward to fully embracing the pharmacist's role of care providers. And I want to thank APHA for driving that change. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone want to join the team? Have I convinced you? Thank you.
That is a great question. We're going to talk about the transitions of care and career when we're talking about the spectrum of correctional services. If you recall, it ended at reentry. In reentry is such an invaluable opportunity for us going forward because at the reentry level, our patients are learning how to take care of themselves. So they're not limited to just seeing the system's uh, care provider. They can see providers and we can them. But with uh, our new health uh, care provider status, we're looking for opportunities to really branch out, to keep that momentum going, because we know we're making a difference inside of the facilities. Better diabetes control, better control for respiratory diseases, for HIV, for Hep C. Uh, but outside, we want to continue that momentum because we, the idea is that our positive outcomes we're able to achieve inside is supposed to carry through. And so we're very interested. If you have any ideas, I'd love to talk to you. But uh, we're looking forward to venturing into that space. I'll, I'll add a little bit of that um, uh, to that and talk about the, the um, in the jail setting that I talked about where the average length of stay turns over so quickly. Transitions of care is a real problem because patients get transported to court. That's one of the other adjacent activities going on. And if they make bail, they're leaving from court. There's no opportunity to plan for release medications or anything like that. We do provide release medications both in jail and prison settings. And there's a number of programs without getting into detail, I'm talking about them to solve for that particular issue. Um, but beyond providing chronic care medications and making sure patients have a month supply of drugs, there's a lot of transition care planning that happens on the non-pharmacy side, making sure people, when they're incarcerated, um, get uh, access to health insurance, get signed up for Medicaid, um, so that when they're uh, able to be released. And there's a lot of release program, particularly around substance use disorder, uh, making sure that people have access to their medication, uh, that they have injectable medications in their system when they're released um, to solve some of these issues. So thank you.
they haven't committed a crime or are suspected of committing a crime. I would say that a lot of people that are detained in jails and prisons maybe aren't, you know. Anyway, we won't go into that. But uh, there is definitely a continuity of care crisis uh, that needs to be addressed. Yeah, and a lot, a lot of fewer people are held in ICE detention these days than used to be even five years ago. Um, the the um, people being turned away to go back into the correction or being released into the community quickly. It's the same issue I talked about with the jails where people bond out from court. Um, so it's a very challenging environment to provide care because you don't have the patient for very long. Um, is the reality. I'll ask one more. Can I just say one more thing? Before I leave this podium, and you have to listen to what I say, I just want to say thank you to the Correct Rice Club team that's here tonight. Thank you so much. What, what does the road to trust look like? Most of the patients trust you the first time you're with them, or it takes a few visits, or what's What's the road? This is a very different clientele, right? Um, what's the road to trust them? We have so many people who could better answer this question <laughs> in front of us, but... Um... Well, the road to trust is that they know that you're there for them. Which most of our patients have some type of problem uh, that's being addressed through medications. And in the prison setting, because the average length is 2.7 years, they have time to develop that relationship with the patient. The first time they're seeing that patient, you know, it could be for HIV, it could be for diabetes, for anti-coag. And when they see that, when they see our pharmacists go through their medication and really take time to see how they're doing with the medication, as opposed to having their treatment plan told to them, the first two-way communication, I think uh, it does a lot for developing that relationship. And there's definitely a two-way communication. Our 
reminder that every patient deserves good pharmaceutical care. Absolutely. No matter where they are. But enough about me. It's now my turn to turn it over to our distinguished executive director, Ben Blum, to uh, give the concluding remarks for today's session. Well, what an amazing presentation. Thank you again, Kareem and Hugh, um, and to Ellen and the whole ConnectRx team. Um, also, uh, thanks, uh, special thanks to our other award winners, Stephen and Mike and Lydia. Uh, it's been a really uh, great time this afternoon. Uh, we'll post this uh, lecture and the Q&A on the APHAfoundation.org website so you can share and reflect on the wonderful lessons and innovation shared today. Finally, we'd like to again extend our sincere thanks to her for their continued support of this 2023 APHA Foundation Pinnacle Awards program. So um, the APHA Foundation is very fortunate to have a number of individuals who support our organization in all kinds of ways. There are also foundations and corporations who regularly contribute to our research agenda, scholarships, programs, projects, and special initiatives. And we're grateful to those of you who've supported us in all of those efforts and who've joined us today from across the country and for your support of the APHA Foundation. It's your investment in our mission that keeps the APHA Foundation on solid footing. We're humbled by your support, and we're forever grateful. Also, as members of Team APHA, we can't do this without your membership support. So if you're not a member of APHA already, we'd encourage you to, uh, to join us together in doing the good work that we're here to do collectively. Um, also, I'd like to um, ask a few key uh, individuals to stand. Hopefully I'm not going to miss anybody from our foundation team and from the others at APHA who are here this afternoon um, who've made this event possible for us. So Jason's already standing back here, but I'd like to ask Emily to stand and Jonathan to stand and Shannon to stand. And then also, is Megan in here? Without Megan, none of this event would be organized. We'd like to ask Brian to stand for all of the support that he provides to us, and Wendy and Monica, if they're here. So, we have a huge team of individuals that supports us, that makes these events possible, and we're really grateful to everyone in attendance and everybody dedicated to our work and their selfless actions that help us to do the good uh, that we're after. So um, uh, uh, thanks for um, you know, being here and for your commitment to demonstrating how pharmacists can improve health care. Uh, we want to invite everybody to now mingle and enjoy dinner together. And at 5.30, we're going to have a special announcement for those of you who haven't been here uh, to Pharmacy's home on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. Um, uh, we're going to offer a historic tour of the building. So that will commence around 5.30 or so. More details to be announced from the podium if you'd like to uh, attend that. And otherwise, enjoy each other's company and the passions that we all have for doing more good for those that we serve. <laughs>